Very glad to be here again to speak about one of my favorite subjects, <clears throat> Billy Bonnie. And uh, let me go ahead and say to you right now that at the end of this program, there's going to be a little musical treat for you. Uh, the book that you see up on the screens there, you can see that it has a musical message to it. And the last page of that book is a piece of sheet music. And that's really the piece of music that the entire book is, revolves around. And it's, a, um, it's about a reporter in Santa Fe who is assigned to interview this kid who's in jail to find out what he's all about. And boy, does he get his money's worth because they become friends <clears throat> and we hear the, his story through this reporter's eyes as he interviews the people who knew Billy long after Billy has died. This is our man. This is the only known, authentic image of him. We don't know much about his beginnings because uh, he's, his parents were Irish immigrants. They came into New York, and at some point there, Billy was born. We, we guess it to be around 1859. And he has a brother. But historians debate on whether or not it was an older brother or a younger brother. There's two years difference. I feel convinced that it was an older brother, and I'll, I'll get to that when I talk a little bit more about him. But here's what we know about the parents. Uh, nothing about the father. And the father dies very soon in this story, probably there in New York. The mother is a jovial, loving Irish mother who loves to sing and dance. This is the only image we have of Billy's brother. Oh, let me go back. You know, you're probably wondering about that name there. William Henry McCarty. That's Billy the Kid. He had many names throughout his life, and we'll go over them through as we run through these pictures. But he went by Henry. His brother was Joseph, called Josie. It's the only image we have of him in his later life. And basically, he gambled in his way through life. That was his, his passion and, and a little bit of mining. When the father died in, in New York City, at some point, we don't know when, the family of three McCartys travel to Indiana. And there, Catherine meets this man who was an express driver on a wagon, probably met on a delivery route at some point. And Catherine is 12 years older than this man. But they develop some kind of relationship. We really don't know how this went. Uh, we don't know if it was love at first sight, regardless of a dozen years difference, or if it was a friendship that developed. But, but he did get close, and he stayed with them and they moved to Wichita, Kansas. And this is where our young Henry McCarty gets his first taste of what the Wild West is really like because Wichita was a tough town. And that's all mainly because uh, it was a cattle town. And that means that Texas cowboys came up with those herds each year. And once they hit the end of that trail drive, you know all about what happens there. That's, those, those men lived wild lives after their job was done. They figured they were owed it. But there are several things that come to light in Wichita. One is that um, Catherine has developed lung problems. And so they decide to help her health-wise. Uh, and even after she's really entrenched herself in Wichita, she has... Uh, she runs a laundry, very successful. She's active in civic politics, which is very unusual for a woman at that time. But her lung problem becomes an issue, and so they decide to move to Denver, thinking that higher elevation will be the answer to that. So they go there, but it doesn't work. So then they get more advice, 
And what they need is high desert where the humidity is very low. And so they travel south to New Mexico. They stop in Santa Fe. And after eight years of Mr. Antrim being with Catherine McCarty, they marry in Santa Fe. Then they keep traveling south. And one might wonder why they keep going. You know, Santa Fe would have been a fine place to settle. And we find, we'll find out about this later. Silver City is the town where they head to. And that's all based upon, of course, a mining operation there for silver. Turns out that Mr. Antrim's main interest is mining for ore. He's a born prospector. He's that loner type. So when they get to Silver City, this is really where young Henry McCarty, now named Henry Antrim, this is where he experiences his brief boyhood. And I mean brief because things are about to happen for Henry that will change everything about his life. But while he's here, while he's growing up, making friends and having fun and going to school, I thought I'd tell you uh, something that, that was said about him and his mother by one of Henry's friends, a young boy named Louis Abraham. He said this, Henry's mother always welcomed us after school with a smile, with a joke, and cookies. Henry was a good boy, maybe a little more mischievous than most of us at that time, but certainly more nervy. His eyes were always dancing with mischief. At this time in Silver City, we find out that Catherine has consumption. Now that's a death sentence in the Old West. Um, there were things that were thought to help with it, but it turned out that many of those things just were really the flip side of help. They exacerbated the, the disease. So she's there now. Her husband, Mr. Antrim, has gone off to Arizona Territory to prospect because, you know, the latest news there is that in this place called Clifton, Arizona, you've got a strike. And so that's where Antrim goes. Catherine is back in Silver City and in her small house that they obtained, she's doing laundry for people. She's boarding people there. I don't know how that worked. I think it was a one-room cabin. But she took in boarders, and she was a baker to sell these things publicly. We found out about Henry that as a boy, he has a true penchant for mischief and adventure. And we also find out that he has a love for the Hispanic culture. He speaks the language. I don't know how he did this, but he just learned, he picked up the language and he spoke it so fluently that the native people just accepted him there. The native New Mexicans, I should say. Another person in Silver City who had good things to say about Henry was his teacher. Mary Richards was from England, and she had this strong English accent, and Billy was smitten. <laughs> he, was, uh, he was taken by her, and he was convinced that Mary Richards and he were long-lost relatives that fate had brought back together. Can you imagine her, her face as, she, as he told her that? And she says, well, why do you think that, Bill? He said, well, for one thing, we're both multilingual. I'm sure he didn't use those words, but she spoke uh, several different languages from her cultured uh, education in, in England. But the other thing was that Mary Richards was ambidextrous, and so was Billy. I should say, Henry. That's going to slip a hundred times during this program. Henry, Billy. <laughs> uh, Henry was... Uh, he could do anything with his left hand that he could do with his right. Which is a little funny because, you know, that famous tintype image of him, you know, tintypes always show things in reverse, and modern folks didn't realize that, and they, everybody thought that, that Billy the Kid was left-handed. And that's why there was that movie that came out with Paul Newman called The Left-Handed Gun. It was actually a flip of the photo, but it didn't matter. He, he could have been wearing that gun on his left side. There were other people in, oh, here's what, uh, by the way, what Mary Richards said about Billy. All, all these people were interviewed much later, you know, after the, 
after the death of Billy the Kid. And uh, there were people who wanted to know, what was he like as a child? Well, this is what Mary Richards said about this young 14-year-old boy who weighed 75 pounds. Think about that. Henry was a scrawny little fellow with delicate hands and artistic nature. He was always helping with chores. Here's what other people in town, this is a collection of quotes from different people, how they described him. Listen to these adjectives and phrases. Courteous, anxious to please, he read and wrote well, he was spirited, he danced and sang, he was very daring, he was courageous, and I like this one a lot, he had an alert mind and he had quick reflexes. And he showed the beginnings of being a ladies' man. You know why that was? Because he was a dancer. He went to these Spanish dances that were called bailes. When you see it on print, it looks like bales, B-A-I-L-E-S. And he, he danced. And the, those senoritas there saw him dancing, and he was a good-looking boy. And they wanted to dance with him. And the parents' chaperones there let them because Billy spoke their language. They knew that he loved their culture. Here's another view on Henry Antrim in Silver City. Sheriff Harvey Whitehill. Now keep in mind that he's the sheriff and that he's saying this long after the fact. He said, I didn't trust his eyes. He looked like a bad man to me. This could be a, a Monday morning armchair prophet talking here, you know, wanting to look like he wasn't, he wasn't taken in by who this person really was. Billy, uh, his first crime that's, uh, that's known to historians is really just the planning of a crime. He planned to steal jewelry from a department store that belonged to a man named Derbyshire. And Billy made the mistake of sharing his adventure to be with a friend of his. And the friend kind of panicked and thought, golly, Billy's going to get in a lot of trouble for this. Henry is going to get in a lot of trouble for this. So uh, I better go tell Mr. Derbyshire. <laughs> so he did. He ratted on him. Mr. Derbyshire took Henry aside and just really gave him a scolding, hoping that would do the trick. The sheriff was not involved in that. Now about this time, Catherine dies. And this is a, a, a rare image of that actual grave marker, thanks to a gentleman named Bob McCubbin who died last year, had the greatest collection of Western photographs, I think it's, that's a fair thing to say, right, of anyone in the world. And uh, he was so generous in sharing these photos. Mr. Antrim, who's over in Clifton, Arizona, did not bother to come back. So the two brothers, Henry and Josie, are left here to deal with their mother's death. They couldn't afford a sexton to dig the grave, so the two brothers dug it along with the help of that friend, Louis Abraham, whose quote I gave you earlier. The boys are farmed out to families. Henry first went to a family called the Hudsons, and then to the Knights, and then finally to the Truesdales. And this looked like a good thing, because Clara Truesdale, the mother in this family, was a true angel. She had nursed Billy's, Henry's mother for months before she died. And so she was well known. She did love Henry. And so they took him in. And the father, Mr. Truesdale, ran a hotel in Silver City. And so he took Bill, Henry on as an employee to wait on tables and wash dishes in the restaurant as a way of balancing out uh, getting room and board from their family. And listen to this quote from Mr. Truesdale. I love this. He's the only boy I ever had in my employ who never stole from me. <laughs> and yet soon enough, Henry did steal something. Not from Mr. Truesdale, but here's what he stole. 
a tub of butter from the back of someone's wagon. When he was caught trying to peddle it off to a merchant to be sold, the sheriff got involved. And the sheriff had two sons who were best buddies with Henry. So he didn't really want to throw the law <clears throat> book at him, but he wanted to teach him a lesson. <clears throat> he wanted to get him on the straight and narrow path, so he gave him a public spanking. This is probably something Billy never forgot. So where does, uh, where does he go now? Because the Truesdale, Mr. Truesdale throws him out. He ends up next in a boarding house run by a Mrs. Brown. And in this boarding house, also boarding there, is a young fellow named George Schaefer. He's older than Henry, but uh, he wants to be a desperado. So he's changed his name. You've got to have a good nickname if you're going to be a bandit, you know. So he changed his name to Sombrero Jack. <clears throat> so Jack, he, uh, Jack takes advantage of a little social event that goes on in Silver City. There's a Chinese laundryman named Charlie Sun whose wife is Chinese, and the wife gave birth to an African-American baby. So what did Charlie Sun do? He killed the baby. So Charlie Sun is very low on the list of uh, popularity in Silver City. And Sombrero Jack decides to break into his laundry and steal whatever he can. So he gets blankets, clothing, and two pistols. And he asks Henry, can you help me hide some of this stuff in your room? Henry says, yeah, that'd be an adventure. <laughs> Mrs. Brown, cleaning his room, finds it, brings the sheriff over. Now the sheriff is involved in something more serious. He takes Henry to jail. He says later in interviews that he had no intention of keeping the boy a long time. He just wanted to scare him. But he told Henry that you could be here for months waiting on the circuit judge. This is a serious crime. So Henry says, well, okay, but look, I'm not getting enough exercise in here. So can, can you let me have some more time outside? And the sheriff said, I'll tell you what we'll do is we'll leave your door open to the cell certain times of the day, and you can use the cell block corridor here and walk up and down here. So on that very day, after they first installed that new rule for Henry, <clears throat> the sheriff returns from his duties and thinks he'll check up on Henry to see how he's doing. So he unlocks the cell block door and walks in, looks in the cell. Billy's not there. Henry's not there. <laughs> Looks in the other cells. No Henry. Looks around the ceiling, probably. Around the floor, probably. Where else can you look? And then he looks down at the end of the corridor, at that small fireplace. And he starts thinking about this scrawny kid of 75 pounds and thinking, uh, is it possible? So Whitehill sits down and leans and looks up the chimney and sees fresh scuff marks in the soot. This was the first of many great escapes by Billy the Kid. So he, he got off to a, one of the families that he had lived with, the Knights. They gave him a horse. He took off for Arizona Territory to find his stepfather. He needed help. When he found him, they, they got aside alone to talk to one another, and Henry told him what had happened. And uh, he said, I, I need some help. I need to stay with you. And Antrim's response to that was, I want to have nothing to do with you. N don't ever come back to me again. So leave. And so Henry left, but on his way out, he stopped by wherever Mr. Antrim had his camp or room. We don't know. But he stopped by there, and he lifted a pistol and some clothes. So that was his goodbye gesture to his stepfather. Henry travels on into, further into Arizona. He decides to call himself Kid Antrim. He really didn't have much choice about it. Everyone was calling him Kid because he was so small. So he, uh, he tries his hand at what every other young man tries his hand at in that area, and that was moving cattle around and knowing how to use a horse and a rope. And he just wasn't very good at it. 
He was, he was uh, too slight of stature. But he, he had a job for a while with one of the most famous cattlemen of Arizona Territory, Henry Hooker. If you know the Wyatt Earp story, that's a familiar name to you. He was a good friend of Earp. And Henry also worked for John Chisholm, another big name in cattle from Texas to New Mexico. And he had kind of a cattle empire around the Pecos River. But he was fired from both of them. So he decides to wander a little bit. He ends up in a place in eastern Arizona territory called Camp Grant. This is a military installation. This is the way camps and forts looked in that area at that time. I know we usually have an image from television of stockades, right, with the pointed tops on the logs, but this is your typical fort or camp here. And of course, this is a federal institution, and there are soldiers here, and always nearby there develops this uh, community of sin. Uh, saloons and opium dens and gambling houses and brothels to serve the soldiers. So Henry ends up uh, in this area and he, he hooks up with a fellow who, has, who thinks he's mastered the art of horse theft. And Henry learns his craft and works with him. Henry is caught. Henry is put into the brig here. He tries to escape once by throwing sand into a soldier's face and trying to make a run for it, but he doesn't make it. One of his few escape failures. So guess what he does next? He escapes anyway through an air vent. <laughs> the second of his great escapes. He decides it's time to go straight. He gets a job working on a hay ranch. You know, hay was a big deal. And you could get a contract with forts to supply hay, and that was a great economical thing for you if you were the rancher. So Henry is a worker here on a hay ranch and having a legitimate job. On the first day of the job, he's working for this man named Sorghum Smith. Don't you love these names that pop up? And so he goes to Sorghum and he says, would you consider giving me a, an advance on my payment? And Smith says, well, what do you need that for? And Henry says, I got some necessities I need to purchase. Well, how much do you want? $40. Now, to understand what $40 means these days, you have to multiply that by 23. Think about that a moment. We're getting up into the $900 in advance. Now... You know what Billy had? What Henry had? It's charisma. Because he got that advance. And what did he buy? A pistol, a holster, and ammunition. On one of his first times off from work, he goes into that sin city near Camp Grant. And he goes into this saloon on the right, belongs to a, a man named Atkins. If you look at that sign, it says saloon and bank. That's the real thing. I mean, establishments like this served as banks, loaning money at interest. Um, he walks in this saloon because he loves to gamble. And in the saloon on that particular time is someone who has given him trouble before. It's a bully, a man who weighs 100 pounds more than Henry. And his name is Francis Cahill. Goes by Frank, but most people call him Wendy. You know what a Wendy is in Old West culture? It's a tall tale. That's a nice way of saying a lie. So this guy was blustery. He liked to put on a show. He's very big and strong, you know, blacksmith. And he loved to pick on people that he knew he could get away with. So Henry was his target. And he started bad-mouthing Henry and called Henry a pimp, as if Henry had something to do with the, the renting out of prostitutes. Well, Henry didn't like that. He said, call them a son of a bitch. So Cahill couldn't have that. 
not in front of all these people. So he knocked Henry down three times, and then he wrestled him out the door, and on the outside the door, he pinned him to the ground, had his knees on, his, on Henry's arms, and just started slapping him, slapping him back and forth. And Henry was pleading for him to get off. He was really hurting, and the man wouldn't do it. Henry was able to work one hand f free to get his gun out of his holster, pulled it up, pushed it up against Cahill's gut, and pulled the trigger. There were several people there who witnessed it. Now, everybody around there was yelling, just like you see idiots yelling around a cockfight, right? People seemed to love a fight. But there were some people there who saw it exactly for what it was. It was self-defense. And when you had one man overpowering another like that, just because one man's weapon was a gun, that didn't matter in those days. You could, you could get away with self-defense for that. But Henry was not going to take a chance on that. So he did what he knew best. He escaped. He walked out of that, that saloon and he grabbed the first impressive looking horse he could find. It turned out to be a famous race horse. So he took off on it, and guess what he did later? He returned that horse by way of someone else. I'm giving you a little insight onto what this m mind is in Henry McCarty, in Henry Antrim, Kid Antrim, the way he's thinking. He's got a conscience, doesn't he? So now he's wanted. Where do you go when you're by yourself and you're wanted by the law? You go to other people like that. There's an organization of outlaws, and rustlers, and killers who call themselves the boys. And this was one of the worst collections of human specimens you could imagine. Uh, one of them was named Jesse Evans. And he more or less mentored Kid Antrim in the art of cattle rustling and horse theft now from horseback. His, his horse thefts before were done on foot using a rope. But now he's, he's learning the specialization of this skill. And he's, for the first time, he's living among people who have been completely desensitized from the sin of taking a life. That, that consciousness is gone with these people. That's something that probably no one in this room can relate to. I know I can't. I see that as being the ultimate wrong thing, to rob someone of their life. But these people did it so easily and without forethought or afterthought that he was now living in a whole new world with these people. He even witnessed one of the boys killing a man's dog in order to see the man's reaction. That was the purpose of killing the man's dog. Now you saw how passionate I got about not killing humans. We get into dogs. That's a whole new level for me. All right, let's see what kind of person we... Before we leave this picture, I must point out the man standing in the center. His name is John McKinney. Would you please look at his mustache? That's all I'm going to ask you to do. I want you to memorize his mustache. Has anyone ever asked you to do that before? <laughs> okay, here we go. I want you to, to know what this young man was like now. I mean, these are descriptions from people who knew him. So just to give you something to look at while I say this, forgive me, but... Val Kilmer played Billy the Kid in a movie, but let me read to you in 1877, these were the descriptions of Kid Antrim. He's 17 years old. He's lean and muscular, meaning athletic, not muscle-bound. He's lithe as a cat. He's five foot seven and weighs 135 pounds. Guess what? That's the average male dimensions of that time. He has wavy brown hair, clear blue eyes, slightly protruding front upper teeth. He's very neat. He's very courteous. He loves a joke. He does not drink or smoke. What? <laughs> We're talking the Old West here. He loves to gamble, dance, and sing. 
you speak Spanish fluently, and he has charisma. Now, the boys, that group you saw earlier, they were just a, you know, that was just a trio from a very large group of outlaws. One of the jobs that they fulfilled was in the town of Lincoln, New Mexico. There was a, a combination of businessmen there, whom you will meet soon, who dominated the town, dominated the county, really. And they built a mercantile there that served as the local bank. And they were happy for someone to take out a loan and with a high interest and not be able to pay it back. And then they would foreclose on their property. These men just accumulated so much property from this technique. They were part of a much larger um, organization of criminal minded civil servants throughout the whole government of the territory. It was called the Santa Fe Ring. It is probably, if not the most, one of America's most blatantly uh, corrupt governments. From the governor to the attorney general, who was probably the worst, down to judges, and prosecutors, and all the way down to county sheriffs. The Santa Fe Ring. This is Lincoln. These, the boys supplied cheap, stolen cattle to these men I was talking about so that they can then supply it at a cost to the local fort, which is Fort Stanton, which is eight or nine miles outside of Lincoln. <clears throat> and they also supply beef to the nearby Mescalero Apache Reservation. These are both federal contracts that they hold. This is a big income for these people to have this. So they're getting basically free beef from their outlaw accumulators, the boys. Here they are. The original two of this combine in Lincoln that has a stranglehold on everyone who lives there. These are two Irishmen, ex-soldiers, who have come together into business to get rich at the expense of everyone else. They're the only mercantile in town. <clears throat> they basically control everything including the local sheriff, another Irishman, another ex-soldier. He's a buddy of theirs, but he's in great debt to Jimmy Dolan on the left. The man on the right, Murphy, he's about to go out of the picture here for us because he's drinking himself to death. But Dolan is a person that the sheriff owes money to. And so the sheriff does Dolan's bidding. Whatever he says to do, the sheriff does it. So the corruption is very contagious here. And keep in mind that, that other people who fall into this category of being in Dolan's pocket include judges and prosecutors. Enter a new face into Lincoln County. John Tunstall, a very proper Englishman, can you imagine when our, our boy meets another English-speaking person, where his mind went with that? Mary Richards, the teacher. Well, let me tell you how that meeting came about. Tunstall has come to Lincoln to challenge Dolan's monopoly there. He's going to build his own mercantile. He's going to be a cattle baron, and he's going to get those contracts. He's going to make money. He's very ambitious but he's also very naive. It's almost cruel to call him that because what he's naive about is he is, is expecting the letter of the law to protect him, but the letter of the law does not exist here. This town of Lincoln, where he has chosen to live, has had so much bloodshed 
and is going to have so much more because of these outlaws that ride for Dolan. Of all the murders in America in the, in the 1870s, 15% of them happened in Lincoln County, New Mexico Territory. 15%. That's what he's naive about. He's entering, in, it's, it's like a bunny rabbit walking into a, a den of alligators. It, there's just no hope for him there. Um, he has some of his horses stolen by the boys. And one of those boys is our boy, Kid Antrim. And he's arrested. And he's put in jail. And now the strangest thing happens. When Tunstall goes to the jail to meet this boy, instead of prosecuting him, he offers him a job. There's only one word for that. Charisma. He had to have seen something in Kid Antrim that impressed him. And this was the first man to ever do something for Kid Antrim. He gave him a job, a really nice job, on a great burgeoning idea of a, of a ranch. And he also gave him the promise of having his own ranch one day. All of this is part of the package. He gives Billy, for that's what he's now calling himself, I can, I can now stop stuttering over Henry. Billy, uh, Henry takes on the name William H. Bonney. He just chooses that. I figure that's got to have something to do with his father, but we don't know. But he goes by Billy. <clears throat> Billy's got this job, new guns, new horse, new rifle. This is something new for him. This is a watershed moment. He's going straight for good. All that other stuff, all that crime, that's behind him. That's gone. All right, here is a name and a face I'm betting most of you have never heard of. And yet, it is, you could probably say that it is because of this man's death that we have the Lincoln County War, which is just about to explode. This is a German who served in the U.S. military and was a friend of Murphy and Dolan and Brady. And he's one of the quiet partners in their business. He gets very sick, and he goes back to Germany to see his family before he dies. And while he's over in Germany, he dies. Turns out he's left behind a $10,000 life insurance policy that nobody knew about. <clears throat> and now, all of a sudden, Dolan says that his accounting books show how much money he owed their partnership. And so Dolan wants a big chunk out of this life insurance so he hires this man, a Scotsman. Interesting, these backgrounds, you know. Tunstall is English. Dolan is Irish. Well, there's a story there, you know, that's already in place. And now we've got a Scotsman come in. He's an attorney. And Dolan hires him to handle this whole thing about the life insurance policy. So McSween goes off to St. Louis, and then he goes up to New York City. And he retains law firms to help with this. He's successful, but he's amassed this huge expense in his travels. And when he comes back to New Mexico territory, he's afraid that if he turns over, turns over all this money that he's collected, that he won't be paid properly by Dolan because he knows Dolan. So he holds it back. So Dolan takes him to court. And who's in court waiting on him but those judges and those prosecutors who are in the pocket of Dolan. It's all fixed. And so the outcome of that is that McSween is, is ordered to hand over physical materials in place of any money that he won't give up. Dolan uses that writ of attachment to include John Tunstall, the Englishman, claiming that they are partners. <clears throat> you could say they were partnered up, but they weren't legally partnered yet. So Dolan got the sheriff to go after these materials and just raided Tunstall's store. And they sent, on Dolan's order, the sheriff sent a posse comprised of the boys to Tunstall's ranch. And on the face of it, they were to, they were to take horses back from Tunstall. 
The horses didn't belong to Dolan. They were a separate entity all to themselves. But it was only for appearances anyway, because what these boys did when they got there was they caught up to Tunstall, who was riding with a group away from his ranch, and they assassinated him right away without a word spoken. And the attack came on suddenly, and everyone ran for it except for Tunstall. Tunstall was, was depending on the law protecting him. He turned his horse around to face these men and rode toward them, raised an arm and said, what's the problem here? They shot him out of his saddle. Billy Bonnie was part of that group that ran. He, he ran just as he, any of us would have if we were all on horseback and expecting Mr. Tunstall to come right along with them. But Tunstall turned around and went toward his death. Just a few months later, oh, before I leave that, I should say, remember that watershed moment of, of finding Mr. Tunstall? Well, now this is the other, the other side of that. This is more like a dam bursting now. And I guess you'd have to call the lake behind that dam revenge. They have killed Billy Bonnie's mortal savior on this life on earth. This man who has offered him so much, he's gone. And now Billy is, is back to, to square one. In just a few months, they kill McSween as well. So both of these men who had partnered up to challenge Dolan have been murdered. And who was the strong arm in this? It was the boys, and they were working for Dolan. They set McSween's house on fire with people inside, including Billy Bonney. Guess what Billy did? Can you say the word? Escape. An amazing escape. The house was completely on fire. Several people make a run for it. Remember that mustache? Billy Turn had shot the mustache off of John McKinney. <laughs> and then he ran to safety. McSween walked out and was shot to death. Tunstall's employees organized into a group they call the Regulators. Here are a couple of them. Dick Brewer, a highly admired man, very good looking, very strong, much admired, hot temper, uh, but a good leader. He was from Vermont. Next to him there is a part Chickasaw man named Fred Waite, highly educated, had been to college but good with a gun. On the left, a Georgian, Charlie Beaudry. He's from Wilkes County, Georgia. That's halfway between Augusta and Athens. A known killer. A good person to have on your side in a fight, because that's what's coming. And on the right, Doc Skurlock from Alabama. A poet and a killer. So these are the men who are on one side of the war, against the boys and against Dolan. Take a look at this other side. I want you to pick out any face and just look at it. And you already know something about this side. There's not a pleasant face in that crowd. On the right photo, that's Jimmy Dolan sitting down. And that's big Bob Olinger a friend of his on the right, and he will play a big part in the story to come. Cold-blooded killer. Cold. He was known on at least two occasions to trick somebody by acting friendly, walking up to them and shaking hands with them, and while shaking hands, pulling out his gun and sticking the gun barrel into the stomach of his adversary and killing him. You know, a shot to the gut in those days was... Uh, was a horrible trip to death. The first victim in the Lincoln County War was the sheriff, the corrupt sheriff, who represented Dolan in all ways. One morning, as the sheriff was leaving Dolan's store with his entourage of deputies slash bodyguards, they're walking down the middle of the street on April 1st. 
and in a corral behind an adobe wall are several of the regulators, and they're just waiting for him to come by. And when he does, they open up on him. Brady is killed. A deputy is killed. Everybody scatters. Billy and one other guy run out to Brady's body. We don't know why his pal Jim French ran out there, but I'm, I'm figuring that Billy went out there to take back his rifle that the sheriff had illegally kept from him from when he was arrested. But Jim French got shot in the leg by running out there. But the point of that is that Billy didn't mind being seen doing that. He's criticized a lot for hiding behind that wall and, and murdering like that. It, it is a lowly way to murder. But he was, uh, he was doing it the only way he knew how, and he wasn't afraid to show his face. There have been lots of complaints to the territorial government. That did nothing. This blood-soaked street in Lincoln, the town of Lincoln, was becoming nationwide famous, and now complaints were going to Washington, and Washington started to respond. President Hayes decided to kick the corrupt governor out of the territory and put in a union general named Lew Wallace. We know Lew Wallace mainly because he was the author of Ben-Hur, and all through this Billy the Kid episode of his life, he was working on Ben-Hur at that time. He didn't like New Mexico. He really didn't care to be there. He didn't like being the territorial governor. But he went down to Lincoln to make a, an effort to bring peace to the area. So he promised amnesty to anyone who would lay down his arms and return to a peaceable life, except for people who already had an indictment out on them. And Billy Bonney falls into that category. So Billy and the governor exchange letters. And they meet one night secretly in Lincoln in the back of a house. Only three people know about it. The governor and the man who owns the house and Billy Bonney. And they meet there and they decide that Billy will testify in a court of law against Jimmy Dolan in a murder case which Billy witnessed, and in exchange, Wallace will set Billy absolutely free. He used these words, you will be scot-free. I'll give you a piece of paper to that effect. You can carry it on your pocket. Billy followed through. He went to court. He testified against Dolan. Wallace went to the court and stayed there for an amount of time, and he told the prosecutor and the judge that there was a gubernatorial edict that Billy Bonney was to be set free in exchange for his testimony. Well, after Wallace left, thinking he had things sewn up, they changed the venue to another town and brought the trial to session, and they did not honor the governor's wish. So Billy Bonney was found guilty of murdering the sheriff and was sentenced to hang in May of that year. What does Billy do? He escapes. He was under house arrest. He took off. Enter Pat Garrett, a man who is ambitious to make some money. Uh, he's got a, definitely got a tough side to him. He was a buffalo hunter, and that's, uh, you know, his, it's little as you may think of buffalo hunters because looking at it, back on it from our conservationist viewpoint, it was a tough life, and you had to be tough to endure it. So he was one of those. He was hired, he was appointed as a special appointment sheriff, and then he would later win that by election. But he was appointed to be the sheriff, and his number one priority was to bring in or kill Billy the Kid. That's what they were now calling him, thanks to a newspaper reporter who came up with that idea. Now, Garrett put together a posse and went out in the dead of winter, snow on the ground, and just did a grueling search to find him. But he was assisted by another posse, and credit has not gone out to these people, especially the man who led them, until recently. This man, Frank Stewart, came from Texas, from Tascosa, 
And he probably knew Billy because he's in the horse trade business. And the reason Billy ever went over there was to sell stolen horses. Frank Stewart was appointed as chief deputy for the Canadian River Cattlemen's Association. And they wanted him to go over and re retrieve the livestock that had been taken by the kid. So he got together his posse, and they joined up with Garrett. And so they were, both of those men were in command of this. But we never hear about Frank Stewart because it was eventually, here's, here's a spoiler, it was eventually Pat Garrett who by himself would kill Billy the Kid. And since Frank Stewart was not in on that part of it, his name got forgotten. And many people who told the story of Billy the Kid's life, and they were involved in it. Most of these were on the side of the law, so to speak. And the, uh, the memories that they left behind in their writing build themselves up and leave out other people. And Frank Stewart's one of those people that got left out. The double posse finds the kid and his gang sleeping in this stone house without a fire. There are three horses tied outside. Only three. There were supposed to be four people there. What they don't know is that one horse is inside. Guess whose horse that is? There's a word that's on his mind there. Escape. Billy has his horse inside. So the posse waits outside for daylight. And Garrett's instructions are, when you see a man that walks out of there and he's wearing the following hat, and he describes Billy's sombrero, kill him. So the first person to walk out that, that morning was Frank, oh, sorry, Charlie Beaudry, who happened to be wearing a hat very similar to Billy's. He's carrying a feed bag for his horse, and he's shot up to pieces. Falls back into the house and dies soon. So now we have this standoff. Everybody's aware of what's going on now. It's a stone house. Can't burn them out of there. So there's some yelling back and forth, and Billy thinks that there's an army out there. It's probably around, I don't know, maybe 20, maybe 25 lawmen in the posses out there. But he thinks there's a lot more. And it's just a standoff, just continues for hours. And then finally, the lawmen decide to cook some, to roast some meat over an open fire. And that's the weapon that defeated Billy and his gang right there. They smelled it, and they got so hungry because they couldn't prepare food inside that building. They came out, gave themselves up. Billy is, is manacled and taken to this building in Lincoln, New Mexico. This is the original house and store of the Dolan faction. They called this place the house. They called Dolan's whole business the house. This was the house that controlled Lincoln. Now, Dolan, in the meantime, had gone bankrupt during the Lincoln County War. And he had to sell this house to the county. So now this is the county courthouse. And so now there's a jail upstairs uh, on the top floor toward the back end of the building. But that lighted side of the building that you see, you see that one window up on the second floor? That's the room where Billy was kept. He was shackled to an iron ring bolted into the floor, uh, manacles on his arms and wrist, and leg irons around his ankles. And Garrett told his two deputies who were in charge of watching the kid, one of you will always be with him at all times. And the other thing he said was, don't ever give him the blink of an eye of a moment to turn on you because before you know it, you'll be dead. Here are those two men. Remember Bob Olinger that I mentioned earlier? The bully, that's him on the left. The man on the right, younger man, maybe around 27 or so, James Bell, much more reasonable man. But these are the two who watch Billy. Olinger says to, to Bell in the afternoon, I'm going to take the other prisoners across the street to the Wortley Hotel and have a meal. So he gets all those prisoners and they shuffle out and cross the street. In the meantime, Billy, with his charisma, 
has talked Bell into letting him go to the outhouse behind the building. That's amazing that he talked him into it. He'd already been out to the outhouse once, but Billy saw, this is my chance. This is the one I've been waiting for. So they go to the outhouse, and on the way back, nobody knows exactly what happened, but when they come back into the building and they start up this narrow staircase, somehow Billy gets the better of Bell. Most historians think that Billy, with his slender hands, could slip out of the manacle, and then he used one end of that like a medieval mace and hit Bell with it. And some historians say he got Bell's gun. But another witness says that when Bell was finally found in the backyard dead, he had his gun in his holster. It had never been removed. So here's what I think probably happened, and this is not my original idea. A lot of people believe this. There was probably, most likely, a, uh, a plan being made by the Hispanics of Lincoln County to rescue Billy. Now, this is something that was brought out recently by a relatively new author named James Mills, who wrote a book called Billy the Kid, El Bandido Simpatico. And it's mostly uh, uh, the, the releva- revelations in it are that... Uh, Billy had such uh, camaraderie and support from the Hispanics, and they were planning this breakout. Well, my guess is he got word that they were leaving him a gun in the outhouse. And I think he got that gun and stuffed it in his waistband and pulled his shirt out over it. So when he came out, Bell would not have a clue. And at the top of the stairs, he turns around with that gun. And he begged... Bell, not to run. He said, I don't want to kill you. But Bell panicked and ran for it, and Billy shot him and killed him. Now, across the street, Bob Olinger is sitting with the prisoners having his meal, and he hears this gunshot. And, you know, my thought is, his first thought is this. Oh, no. Bell's killed the kid. I'm not going to get to watch him hang. But he's got to go check on it. So he goes across the street, And Billy, who knows that all the deputies always walk the side trail around the house to get to the back entrance because that's closest to the only stairs that go up. Billy goes back to that window that you saw a while ago from the outside. He raises the bottom of that. He's got in his hands now Bob Olinger's own shotgun, the one that he prodded Billy with so many times and threatened him with. So Billy's waiting for him right here. And when Olinger crosses the street, opens the gate, and starts walking into the vacant lot, he hears his name called. Hello, Bob. And he looks up. There's Billy Bonney holding his own shotgun aimed at him. And it's at that spot where this marker is put. Billy is in no hurry to get out of town. Pat Garrett has gone to White Oaks nearby to buy lumber to make the scaffold to hang the kid. And it's left behind his two deputies to take care of things. The two deputies are dead. Don't give him one blink of the eye, remember? Just like that it happened. It's the most remarkable escape story in the Old West. I think almost any historian will agree with me on that. Billy steps out onto the balcony of that house and addresses the citizens. It's like he's running for governor or something. He's talking to everybody in a friendly way, and he explains, I did not want to kill Bell, but I had to. I have to get out of here, and I don't want anybody to try to stop me because I don't want to kill anybody else. He spent 45 minutes talking to them. He asked someone to get him a horse, and he did. Billy's got one of his, one of his uh, leg irons snapped off by now, but he can't get the other one snapped off. So when he tries to get on that horse, he's got that chain, you know, probably wrapped up in his waistband, and it drops free, and as he gets up on the horse, it scares the horse to death, and the horse stands up on its hind legs and throws Billy. (laughs) Billy gets up laughing. I can't help but think he's saying something to himself like, one heck of a getaway, Billy. (laughs) He gets back, he tucks that thing in tighter, gets up on the horse, and he rides out of town, singing a song. Many people all over the countryside are willing to take him in and hide him. 
And that's what goes on for months. But Billy is eventually drawn toward his favorite place, Fort Sumner. Fort Sumner used to be a military installation, but it became defunct, and so the buildings were sold over to the public. And this house here belonged to a man named Pete Maxwell, who was uh, an acquaintance of Billy's. It turns out that Pete's sister, Paulita, was Billy the Kid's true sweetheart. He was said to have quite a few, that, that smiling, sparkling-eyed dancer. But this was his one true love. Now, he, he and Paulita could have taken off from Mexico, or they could have gone up to the Northwest and changed their names. But there was something about that community and that culture, and that was Billy's home, and he wanted to be there. While Billy is there, and just after he is visited with Paulita, he decides to go cut himself a piece of meat off of a hanging slab of beef on the porch of Pete Maxwell. And when he gets there, he's got a knife, and he's got his gun, because he's Billy. And when he gets there, he sees two people that are strangers to him that he doesn't know. So he asks them in Spanish, who are you? Who are you? And he gets no satisfactory answer from them. So he starts backing into Pete Maxwell's bedroom. Pete Maxwell's gone to bed a long time ago. But in the meantime, Pat Garrett, who has just come to Fort Sumner, has gone into Pete Maxwell's bedroom and is sitting on the edge of his bed talking to Maxwell, where can I find the kid? And then the door opens, and there's the kid. It's a full moon that night, so his silhouette is brilliantly showed up against the door frame. And he says, he's talking to Pete Maxwell. Who's, who's out here, Pete? Who is it? Who is it? Kianess, Kianess. Those were his last words. Maxwell nudged Garrett and said, that's him. So Garrett didn't hesitate. He pulled his gun. Garrett recognized his voice, too. He shot once and hit, hit Billy in the chest. And he shot again out of panic, hit some furniture. But Billy died right there. With this story, what is there of value to American history? I mean, the story about an outlaw. It's a remarkable life, but what is it that we have to learn here? I think maybe the, one of the most important things is to recognize the incredible degree of corruption that existed by, by the choices of men who were in on the ground floor on some place, the territory of New Mexico. And their whole system, the Santa Fe Ring, was enormous. And these people were getting rich at the expense of everyone else. So there's that. But there's also value in looking at how a young orphan responds to being cast out into a life so bloody and how he deals with that. He tries to go straight, but he's not allowed to. There's another value to talk about with all this. Um, there have been so many books written about Billy the Kid. Why another one? This is my book, and I wrote it for the same reason that I wrote my trilogy on Wyatt Earp. I'm not trying to outdo somebody else's biography of Billy Bonnie. Uh, I don't think I could do that. But by offering historical fiction, I can get the reader to know this person better. And I, can do, I feel that I can do this, that I'm given the right to do this by the amount of study that I have put into this. I'm not somebody who chooses a new subject every week and writes a, a, a historical fiction about them. This is somebody that I've poured some of my uh, heart and soul into in studying. So I want the reader to know what this kid is like. And I do it through a newspaper reporter who writes this piece of music for Billy. Billy never got to hear it. But as I told you before, it's on the very last page of my book, and I'd like to play that for you right now. Here's some other values you can consider. The gun that killed Billy the Kid, it sold for over $6 million in auction. The last tintype of Billy the Kid sold for $2.3 million at auction. 
Think about that. That little piece of tin is that big. <laughs> Billy's charisma still lives. It can draw a Georgia researcher all the way to New Mexico just to sit in a narrow hallway where Billy made his great escape. There I sit. Let me play you this song. You know a lot about Billy now that I've shared with you. So I'm going to play you this song. It's debut. This country shows no mercy to a young boy on his own. With no one to light a candle in the window of a home. But if a man lives by his wits and grit and plays the cards he's dealt he just might have what it takes to make that journey by himself hold dear your mother's lullaby it's, it's all that you have left She loved you more than life itself Until her dying breath Forget me not, my bonny child For I will soon depart I am crossing to the other side So hold me in your heart Oh Billy, take the best of her And hold your head up high She taught you your good manners But you still have to survive so keep one eye upon the trail and one eye behind your back. You can live your life just like a king, but watch that one-eyed Jack. There are men who live for evil and will steal away your life. Other men will stand by you and fight until they die. Until you learn the difference, you don't have to be afraid. You just keep that pistol loaded and you'll hold the world at bay. Oh, Billy, me compañero, you were always quick to smile. You laughed right in the devil's face and then charmed him with your guile. The senoritas danced with you and they loved you by and by. As you high step to their music with that twinkle in your eye. They locked you up in heavy chains to pay for all their sins. They sentenced you to hang after they kill most of your friends. But iron bars and prison guards and all the law intends cannot keep a ghost from slipping through the cracks just like the wind. 
Oh, Billy, me amigo, can your soul be really saved? They say you kill for pleasure and then spat upon their graves. But now I know your story and the justice that you sought. You may have been the only one whose soul could not be bought. I could never hope to be like you. I could never match your smile. But I know that I am a better man just to know you this short while. If someone should remember me long after I am gone, I pray that it will be because someone still sings this song. Oh, Billy El Valiente, you were much too young to die. They killed you out of need to save the governor from his lie. Come right along beside me when the desert moon is bright. Your ghost is my companion and my song will be your fight. is my companion and my song will be your fight. Thank you very much. is my companion and my song will be your fight.